Um, okay, thank you all for coming in today. Um, I've been asked to talk about um, the, the reasoning behind our current set of digitization imaging requirement standards. Um, we're currently undergoing a review of those standards, um, which we're about to put out for public comment. Um, so the purpose of today's session is to look at um, the requirements and talk a bit, unpack the jargon basically, and also look at some, some examples of digitization or digitized records in practice and have a think about how those standards apply to what you might call fit for purpose. So we'll start with um, the requirements themselves. This is just a screenshot of the digitization image requirements from um, PRV's capture standard. Um, these were about 2011, I think, these were um, last refreshed when the standards themselves were all reviewed. There are four main requirements. Um, resolution, uh, type of image and bit depth are really the same requirement. I'll mention that in a bit. Color management and compression. Um, this is followed by a big table saying different levels, different numbers for each of those requirements depending on the type of document. I won't go into that too much. Let's just have a look at what each of those things actually means. Which means we need some digital image theory. So first of all, how do we see? That's a chart of the response of the cells in our eyes to um, wavelengths of visible light. Um, most people have three different types of cone cell in their eye um, that uh, basically uh, pick up light of those wavelengths. Um, people who are colorblind actually only have two cone cells, and there are some people who have four. They're kind of like genetically lucky. Um, you'll notice that the three peaks in that chart map onto the red, green, and blue areas of the spectrum in rough terms, um, and it's that three peak um, response that we naturally have has actually been used by computer scientists and engineers to design the imaging devices that we use. So whenever you look at a television or a computer scanner or a camera, you'll often see references to red, green and blue. That's because the cameras are like um, eyes in the sense that they usually have three types of sensor, um, each picking up wavelengths in the red, green, and blue parts of the spectrum, which are then combined to make the colors and brightnesses of the image that we see. As well as picking up those colors from whatever is in front of the camera, it also has to make a copy of those colors somehow. And so there are various forms of computer file, digital image files, which are basically contain the numbers that record what an image is. Um, that a big set of numbers on the left hand of the slide is basically um, most, well, sorry, the important parts, if you like, of the TIFF file that describes the square on the right. So you can't see it in that image there, but if you imagine that square has a white pixel at the very top and at the very bottom, top left and bottom right of the image, um, then you can describe that square um, using the numbers on the left. So you'll see, and these numbers are in hexadecimal format, base 16, by the way, and that's actually a rendition of binary format, which is the core format of TIFF files. Um, but you've got some numbers representing, basically, it just says this is a TIFF file, starts here. Then you've got six Fs, um, which corresponds to the values 255, 255, 255 for each of the red, green, and blue channels. And that corresponds to white. So maximum intensity of each of those three colors mixed together makes white. And then you've got lots and lots of zeros. I've left most of them out. Um, and that's basically reading from left to right, top to bottom. Each dot has a color which happens to be black, i.e. no intensity in each of the red, green, and blue channels. Lots and lots and lots and lots of zeros. Six Fs again, which is the bottom right white pixel. And then some more information, um, which specifies the resolution and a couple of other aspects of that TIFF file. Now, the TIFF standard also allows you to put other sorts of metadata in and so on. This is just a very basic example, courtesy of an imaging specialist at the University of Western Australia. I also briefly mentioned resolution there. So here's the first of our standards. I've got the grids on the screen here. Um, two very common resolutions we hear about are 72 and 300 dots per inch, um, based on US, so it's an inch standard. Um, 
essentially it's how many pixels, um, both across and down, in a square inch of um, either your original or whatever you choose to regard as your, your, um, your image. So it's arbitrary, of course. Like if you have just a projector in this room, we move the projector a bit further away, the pixels are going to be a bit larger once they reach the screen. If you move it closer, they're going to be a bit smaller. 72 dots an inch is a standard because it's what browser makers originally adopted as the rendering resolution of any image. So if you put an image on a web page, um, then regardless of what its original resolution is, it's going to be rendered at what the browser thinks is 72 dots per inch. And so it's picked because, um, of course, when you're delivering stuff over the internet, you can't have your file sizes too large. It's a reasonably detailed resolution, but it's still a very small file compared to a 300 dot per inch, which is a more standard print resolution. At 300 dots an inch, um, generally, if you print that on a page, you can't see the individual dots, even if you look really closely, which is why that's picked. But you can see by just doing the maths, one's got 5,000 pixels per inch, one's got 90,000 pixels per inch. And if you remember that TIFF file, your each pixel has got its own set of six numbers. Um, a higher resolution image is generally a much larger file because it's being squared. The next standard we mentioned was bit depth. I've already started talking this a little bit. Um, it's basically the amount of information that you capture about each color channel. So a standard bit depth is 24 bits you'll hear referred to, or just color. What that means is that in each of the red, green, and blue channels that make up the image, there's 255 possible levels of color that is captured. So zero again is no color in that channel, 255 is full color in that channel. So if you map that across, you can see here, if you imagine that FF, FF, FF that I was talking about before, um, 00, 00, 00, FF is actually blue. FF, 00, 00, 00 is actually red. And if anybody's done any web design, those um, numbers will be very familiar because all of the browser colors are usually rendered as hexadecimal triplets, as it were. The other standard we're talking about is color management. And this is where um, we start sort of moving out of the ideal world into the real world. In the sense that just as everybody in this room sees a bit differently, we talked about color blindness, which is a bit obvious difference. But also if you think about all the psychological and physical differences that goes in our makeup, and if you say, I say red, the color I'm thinking of is not quite the same as you say red. There's a similar kind of process going on with computer imaging in that um, it's converting a voltage generated by a piece of light across a piece of electronics into a number. Different computers, depending on the electronics, will generate different numbers depending on what they're seeing. So color management is actually a way of first characterizing how a particular imager, whether that's a camera or a TV monitor or two more different versions of the same camera, see the same set of colors. And secondly, it's a way of describing those colors against a standard backdrop. So if I move an image file from one device to another, it's being rendered or captured in the same, the, the, the wavelengths are converting at the same values as it were. Hope that makes sense. Um, there are some color, standard color spaces that we talk about. Um, for monitors, um, again, this was set in the early days of the internet, there's something called sRGB. Um, you can see on the left of the chart there is a sort of uh, a, a drawing with red, green, and blue corners. That's what's known as a um, color space. Um, and the triangle in the middle represents the colors that are possible to render within the sRGB gamut. So um, out of the infinite number of colors there are within the visible light spectrum, um, some are too intense or too dull for most imaging devices to pick up, same as we've only got a limited range of vision in our eyes. Um, so in order to make sure that monitors render in the same way, um, they've decided on a subset of all of those wavelengths 
um, and assigned numbers to them and called that the sRGB standard. In terms of imaging, it's actually a fairly limited standard because monitors aren't actually that good at reproducing color compared to other devices. They're fine for everyday use, but if I was an art make printmaker, um, or, or in fact a printmaker of any sort, I usually want a wider range of colors. So another gamut that was developed is called the Adobe RGB gamut, which is used a lot in printmaking. What our standard says is that we would ideally like a color profile, which is essentially a statement in our image files, which says that the images have been standardized to this mathematical model. Now, there's lots of um, tricks to that process doing it well, but often the simplest thing is that um, an imaging device will come out of the factory with the profile already generated for it to one of those two um, standard spaces. And then it's just making sure that the file, even if it's processed through to other um, storage or whatever, doesn't lose that original attachment to that color space. If you're doing your own imaging, it means that you actually have to think about um, um, standardizing your capture devices and your monitors and so on. So it can get quite tricky to do it well. Um, it, whether how much you need to do comes back to how much your images need to suit particular purposes, which we'll come back to. The last concept that's in the standard is compression. So I've got a couple of JPEG images there, and JPEG stands for Joint Photographic Exports Group, and it was originally developed as a method of of taking this original TIFF file, or this set of numbers in the middle of the TIFF file, and making it smaller. Um, TIFF files generally are large, difficult to transmit over the internet, um, especially in the early days of storage technology, or a challenge for computers generally. So what compression means is applying maths to those numbers to represent the same image, but with a smaller number of characters, so the file can be more easily transmitted. The way JPEG does that, and it is the standard compression technique for imaging, is to, first of all, make averages of small parts of the image. So you can see that in the right-hand picture. I've, I've really compressed that image to make the point. Um, so the gray stone with some texture in it just becomes a simple gray block on the right-hand side. So it's thrown away a lot of information about texture. What's less obvious, but it also throws away a lot of information about the colors. So for instance, we're generally less sensitive in the blue area of the spectrum. So you can actually throw away a lot of the variations in blue and our eyes generally just won't notice that sort of thing. That's what's happening when you do that. There are two forms of compression. So JPEG is actually throwing away information. You can't recover it. There's other forms of compression which do reduce the file length, but don't throw away information. They look for common patterns, so you can replace six zeros with one other character. That makes for a shorter file, for instance. They're generally less compressible than lossy compression because they have to be more careful about it. However, again, you, basically because images are so large to begin with as far, computer files, um, it, you, lossy compression is usually more, um, more fit for general purpose. I want to look at some actual images now. Um, so these are just some records. Um, this is a prison register from our collection. Um, you'll notice down the right-hand side, um, our staff member Colin has actually digitized this. You've got a little gray wedge there, we call them. So there's some um, patches of white, gray, and black on a little card. Here's a photograph, which I actually took from the State Library um, online catalog. Um, and you can see just at the bottom of that picture that there's another, in fact, the exact same model of grey wedge there. On this picture on the left, you can kind of see there's a ruler down the side. Um, this sort of practice is very common in museum imaging as well. It's always good practice to put a colour reference and a size reference in your image. Um, for paper imaging, um, we, we will tend to do that as well, particularly when there's photographs in there. And the reason we do that is to make for consistency over when you're doing imaging in bulk. Um, it's not absolutely mandatory, but it does help somebody reading and reusing that image have a sense of what the color values were and what they can do with it. Um, I'll do a little quiz at the moment. 
Um, we've got a black and white picture of essentially a wheat field and some wheat silos here. What color is the sky? It's actually very close to dark gray. Um, even though we tend to interpret the sky as light colored, in this particular picture, um, the, the saturation of the colors is such that it's a very dark color. And if we didn't have the gray wedge in there, which is an example of absolute white, um, the, the way that we intend to interpret that picture would actually be kind of a distortion of what's originally um, uh, laid down on the paper. So um, some sort of standard reference helps with color management in a sense that it helps you have a standard to judge your instant reactions to the way things should look against what the actual color values are. I've just got another slide here of um, just the gray wedge itself um, that we've just scanned by itself. And in front of that is a little um, chart which is called a histogram, which is basically a chart of how many pixels of every color can it see. In this case, the histogram is just a grayscale histogram, so 8-bit, if you want to use the sort of technically language, in the sense that there are 255 possible values in this image file from gray to what, sorry, black to white. And there are three peaks on this chart, um, one down near sort of 0 to about 60, one up the top near about 210 to about 240, and one around about 100. Um, that is because the greys in these wedges are always a bit darker than a neutral grey, um, or a, a, a midway between for reasons I won't go into right now. This is the way that we calibrate our imaging devices in a sense that um, we have something which on paper looks very white and we want to make sure that the paper white that we're seeing is matched by a set of numbers that equates to white. I'll show you another example of that in a minute. Of course, we're talking about red, green, and blue before. That grayscale image for color looks more like this, in the sense you've got three peaks now, uh, red, green, and blue peaks at each of those three areas that together make up that white color. Um, I'm just going to do this in a slightly different order now. This is an example of an image which is underexposed. There is an image in there. It's actually too dark to see on that monitor. Um, this is the histogram for that image. So we know that's a bad image just by looking at it, but we can also verify that according to a numerical standard by saying that the range of values in that histogram is only a tiny fraction of the range of values available to that imager. Um, in this case, they're concentrated between about 40 to about 60. So if I wanted to do any maths on those numbers, there isn't a lot of variation that I can, can, I can do with those. Okay, I'll just go back up a bit. Hold that thought for a second. This has brought up the issue that, as well as those mathematical standards that we're all talking about, there are a range of other things you have to think about when you think about image standards and image quality. Um, this here is a picture that I took of one of our bits of paper under our new overhead scanning downstairs. It wasn't entirely deliberate, but the paper was moved while the scanner was operating. And so you get some distorted text in there and some interesting color effects. Something to watch out for. I also wanted to introduce the concept of um, the different sorts of imager. Um, so that picture you saw before was actually, uh, we call it a scanner on a stick in the sense that um, there's a pole and the scanning head is actually at the top of the pole moving over a, um, over a, a something held underneath. Our common method of imaging volumes is not so much a scanner on a stick, but a camera on a stick, and that's just a picture of one of those. As well as the sort of traditional flatbed scanners which you see, which is basically a, an LCD uh, device moving underneath the picture, um, taking things as they go. Um, the 
That brings up the question of we mandate a resolution. Um, how do we know that we've achieved that target resolution? Um, for a scanner, it's easy because you actually tell the software how big the pixels you want to draw. For a camera, it's a little more difficult because um, the camera is a fixed imager. It has a number of pixels. Um, and the number of pixels that are actually in the target object, how many, how, what size of those pixels, is actually mandated by the distance between the camera and the object and also the focal length of the lens. Um, so this is another picture um, which we didn't end up using, um, which was basically taken when the camera was too far away from the object. There's a number of issues with that, um, including uneven lighting and so on. But the core problem, even if we sort of cropped it back down, was there aren't enough pixels in the object to actually um, render the information present in that object properly. So an alternative to mandating a minimal number of pixels is actually by the National Archives and various other standards is saying you have to have at least two or three pixels in the finest line on the page. And that sort of standard was um, brought in to deal with the sort of problem actually originally when microfilming was around. Um, there's different variations of that problem. Here there are too few pixels because um, the, the camera's too far away. Here the camera is the right distance from the object, but the object's a strange size. It's very much longer than it is tall. Um, you get a similar sort of issue. Um, this is actually, by our lights, an acceptable image because it has got those two or three pixels in the finest line but it's still a fairly pixelated image simply because the original, the original is so large. So the only way we could improve that is to buy a camera with more, more um, pixels in its imager. So I suppose that's just an example of application of those standards. If you want to calculate that resolution, um, you usually just, it's a ratio between the number of pixels in the imager and the um, the number of the, the size of the object. So if you had an A3 object for our standard camera downstairs um, and you filled the frame, uh, it would be about 340 pixels per inch, which is well above our standard. Um, if you had an A4 object, it's even better. It's about 480 pixels per inch because the camera needs to be so much closer to the object. Okay. Just some other um, things to be aware of. Um, imaging is generally a mechanical process, either whether it's a person or a machine, and the process itself can interfere with the image. So in this case, somebody hasn't quite moved their hands out of the way fast enough, and the shadow of their hands is falling on the image, basically. So it's not an even sort of um, light. In this case, there are a couple things going on. Um, the first is that, um, that color of that book isn't very accurate. What's fallen over here is that cameras have a white balance in a sense that they, their white is set according to the room lighting. Um, you know, a different lighting will show you different values. Our eyes generally adjust for that automatically, but um, cameras don't. You actually have to specifically tell them what composition of wavelengths white is in this space. So that book is too yellow. The other problem, and we did actually redigitize all of this one, um, is that because the book has got these big folds in it, it's not so much text is lost, but text at different portions of the book isn't quite in focus. So that's the top left and bottom right of the book. Top left is okay. Bottom right is what we call soft. You can still make out what those, those, um, those characters are, but it's getting difficult towards impossible. There's our um, underexposed version again. There are other variations that occur that are variations but not necessarily problems. So this is a, another image taken with that scanner on a stick I was talking about, which we're about to introduce into the reading room. Um, the issue here is that um, this is an image which is pretty good in terms of capturing the colors and the detail, but it's still not what you'd call an accurate rendition of the original as an object. We've got a couple of issues. Um, so the top left there, you can see how 
the page is distorted and sort of posterized out to white. That's an artifact of how the scanner is interpreting what it sees as it moves over the paper. Um, and if you are interested in the paper rather than the text, that image would not be good enough. We zoom in a bit further, and this is a bit more subtle. I mean, first of all, you can see the compression artifacts. Now, again, in my mind, those are okay because the artifacts are not distorting the meaning of the text. They're at such a small scale that people can read the text at normal size and not even see them, but they're still there. The other thing is that there's a fairly narrow range of color values in that image. It's not a full natural range. You remember we were talking about the gamut before. Um, there's only a few values assigned to the colors there when there's more in the original. Nevertheless, um, it brings up the idea that this image, in most people's uh, cases, would probably be fit for purpose. Here's a slightly better example. This is an um, image taken with our large plan scanner of a map of Albert Park. I'm just showing you detail now. Um, this is the TIFF file, so the one that's uncompressed, showing all of the pixels just one by one. Um, this is the JPEG compressed PDF version that we made of that file to give to people. So again, I'm not sure how well you can see considering you're watching a projector screen at the other end of the room, but there are compression artifacts there. But you can also see that um, uh, problems with the previous image, like the rips in the paper, they're actually fairly well represented in that image. So a map has got more value as an object than just a page of text. Are we capturing the way that object works um, sufficiently for people to, to be satisfied? Um, incidentally, that's about 400 megabyte file. Um, that's about a 20 megabyte file. And file format's really important when we're thinking about long-term preservation. So the four long-term formats that we accept are TIFF, JPEG, JPEG 2000, and PDF. This isn't part of our digitization standard. It's actually part of our electronic record strategy. So those formats are picked partly because they work, but mostly because they're open. Um, we know that they're well supported. We're pretty sure that they'll still be around several decades from now. Um, so one thing to note, though, is that different file formats have different purposes. In that list above, there are a couple of what you might call pure image formats in the sense that all they do is represent pixels, and that's JPEG and TIFF. The other, another formats are actually container formats. So PDF um, is actually just a, it's a standard for specifying the structure of a page um, so it can have text information, it can have picture information, it can have other sorts of information, even videos, sort of all arranged in a space, which you can then print out on a printer originally, or transmit over a, an internet browser these days. That's important because you don't always know what sort of image formats are being used inside container formats. So a Word document, for instance, is famous for this. The older um, versions of Word, the pre-XML versions, re-rendered the pictures at 200 dots an inch in bitmap format, which is a closed standard invented by Microsoft. So even it, it basically requires extra um, software to sort of ex specific to Microsoft to extract and read those files, regardless of how they were before they went into that document. Just some notes on image size. I sort of alluded to this briefly before, um, but again, in terms of practical considerations for imaging, a 24-bit, so color A4 document scanned at 300 dots an inch, which is well above our current standards, is a 24 megabyte file, uncompressed. You can compress that, and then you have to bring some judgment in it, but depending on how much you compress it, which depends on the complexity of the image, between about one and five megabytes. And you can scale up and down. It's, it's, it's kind of linear. So an A1 plan is about 400 megabytes. Um, a 35 millimeter slide is only um, you know, 24 by 36 millimeters in real life. Um, but because you need to scan it at 2400 dots an inch to get all the detail out of it, you're talking about, about another 25 megabyte file or so. 
Um, and we deal a lot in half plate negatives, which are sort of four by five inches. Um, is that right? Six by four images, sorry. Um, at 1800 dots per inch scan for that, it's about 100 megabytes. And people often make their judgments based on quality, based on the size of the, the finished file, um, depending again on the purpose, whether a graphic designer or not. So um, there are various standards, um, which are often people basically bringing light information to the table and making judgments about with all of the sort of potential compromises and shifts, what is most fit for their particular purpose. And I've put up a few links to different standards, um, which vary depending on the purpose of the original organization um, as to what numbers they end actually end up landing on. And to sort of restate that, generally, um, there's a sort of preservation aspect to digitizing, which says for deteriorating originals especially, this, this photograph is never going to be as good as it is now, so I need to get the maximum possible information for it, from it. That means high resolution, it means good proper color management, um, and a lot of care and imaging. The other end of the scale, if you like, is um, access digitizing, which says I need to get a lot of copies of something. So when you're doing um, digitizing of, of letters that come into a council, um, the letter itself is almost no value as an object because it's the digital file. As long as the text is readable, that is generally good enough. And the question becomes then for the project and for the anticipated uses of the object, what is fit for purpose out of those imaging standards? Thank you. <laughs>